Now suppose that we wanted to get the maximum concentration of the zero charge species. How would we calculate the right pH for that? That's right. We didn't talk about that specifically, but you figured that out based on this model over here. That's right. We get the maximum concentration of this species when we average these two. Well, when do we get the maximum concentration of this species when we average these two numbers? And how about if we wanted to have equal concentrations of the zero and the negative one? So those are the two types of questions that your instructor likes to ask. Your instructor likes to ask what pH will give me equal concentrations of two adjacent net charges or what pH will give me the maximum concentration of a particular net charge? Well, it's very easy to find the pH that gives you equal concentrations of two adjacent net charges. That's just the pKa that corresponds to that transition. And it's not that hard now to figure out the pH that gives you the maximum concentration of a species. That's the average of the pKa's on either side. Now we can see why it was very helpful to go through this whole process of first imagining a very low pH and then gradually raising it because to answer all of these types of questions, we need to have this set of numbers and this set of pKa's written out. So anytime that your instructor asks you any of those questions about what's the pH at which we get the maximum concentration of a particular species, or what's the pH at which we get equal concentrations of the species, the way you figure that out is by working out this whole idea. You start by imagining a very low pH, and you figure out what the net charge would be at that very low pH. And then you gradually raise the pH in your mind and write down what the new net charges would be and what the pKa's are that relate to all of those. This is the exact type of notation that should be used for doing these types of problems. By the way, notice then, even though we started by imagining a very low pH, that doesn't mean that we really think we're at a very low pH. That was just a thought process. It was just a useful thought process for solving this type of problem to imagine that we start at a very low pH just to figure out what the net charge would be when everyone is protonated. But that doesn't mean that the question has to be about very low pH because then we gradually raise the pH in our minds. And there's other types of problems where we wouldn't use this method. So oftentimes I see that students start to think that they have to always imagine a very low pH. Well, no, just for this particular method, it helps to start by imagining a very low pH and then gradually raising the pH in your mind just so that you can get a series, get down on paper what all the possible net charges are and what the pKa's are that relate all of those. Let's go back and think about the zero net charge form. How did we get that zero net charge form? Who, who here was protonated and who was deprotonated? Let's see, that was after the pKa of 9 was protonated. I'm deprotonated. And 12.5 was still protonated. Good. And now you can see how we got that zero net charge. Plus one, minus one is zero. Mm -hmm. This is interesting because even though, the net even though the net charge is zero, there still are individual charges. Even when the net, char the net charge is zero here, it doesn't mean there's no individual charges. It just means that there's two charges that cancel each other out. We have two charges that cancel each other out. This situation, when we have two charges that cancel each other out to give a net charge of zero, is called the Zwitter ion. So this picture here is what we call the Zwitter ion. The Zwitter ion is the form with zero net charge when the two separate charges cancel each other out. By the way, zwei is German for two. So this is just German for two ions. Well, that's how we got the zero net charge, right? Because there was two separate ionic centers that cancel each other out. So Zwitter ion just means two separate ionic centers that cancel each other out to give a net charge of zero. Now we have to figure out how to find the PI. 
well, what's the definition of the PI? The PI, by definition, is the pH at which we get the maximum concentration of the zinner ion. The PI is the pH at which we get the maximum concentration Well, we really all already have the skills then to calculate the PI. How would we go about calculating the PI for arginine? We just figure out, basically we just do the average of 9 and 12.5. That's right. Let's go ahead and work that out. Maybe you subtracted those. Yeah. Right. But to find the average, we have to first add the 9 and the 12.5. Take your time. Go back and do the carry. That's right. When you're doing these problems on the test, I would encourage you to write each of the steps down and show all the carrying and everything, because it's a shame to miss some credit if you already understand the method just from the careless math mistake. Mm -hmm. I certainly tend to make careless math mistakes on these when I try to rush on these, so it's always best to show all of your steps carefully. So we've learned now the method for calculating the PI. We've seen that the PI is really just the PI is just the pH in which we get the maximum concentration of the zero net charge species. So it's just the average of these two pKa's. But we also have an apparatus here that can answer many other questions besides just the PI. We can, we can find not just when do we get the maximum concentration of the zwitter ion, we can also figure out how to get the maximum concentration of the plus one ion by averaging these two numbers. And we can also figure out how to get equal concentrations of neighboring ions. For example, to get equal concentrations of the zwitter ion and the plus one, we set the pH at 9.0. Those are all the types of questions that your instructor likes to ask, so it's important to have this method. Before we can solve any of those types of problems, we have to get this whole chart set up, starting with the fully protonated form and working to the fully deprotonated form. Let's check this in your table. What does your table say the PI is for arginine? 10.7. Yeah, they just rounded off, so they get the same answer as us. However, you can see then, your instructor can't just ask you the PI of a simple amino acid because then you can just look it up in the table. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to see, so what could he do? Well, he could give you a structure whose PI isn't in the table, and then you'd have to figure it out on your own. So we're going to have to see how to use this method. For example, your instructor could make up a whole new amino acid that's not in the table. Of course, those are all the naturally occurring amino acids in uh, human physiology, but they, your instructor could make up a whole new amino acid that, doesn't, uh, that isn't important in biology and ask you to find its PI. Well, we use the same method for that. Also, though, your instructor can ask you to find the PI for a whole peptide, a whole bunch of amino acids put together. So that's something we're going to have to go on to do, because those are not in the table. But, now we've, but we've already seen the basic approach, which is to set up this table of the net charges. And remember that we also learned some important things about arginine. We learned who to protonate when you're protonating arginine. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know where it is. I'll just find it later. Okay. 
Well, we have made some progress here because I think we now learned most of the stuff that you would need to know about individual amino acids. So now we can move on to putting the amino acids together into peptides.